Here are seven sunken cruise ships. These hellish stories will make you reconsider your next vacation at sea. Number 7. The MS Explorer The MS Explorer had sailed the Antarctic region for almost 40 years before meeting its end on November 11, 2007. After its expeditionary voyage in 1969, the Little Red Ship, as it was nicknamed, had been considered the pioneer of maritime tourism in the Antarctic region. It was the first cruise ship purposely designed for sailing the Antarctic Ocean. On November 11, 2007, the ship met the end of its long career during a cruise which aimed to follow the route of famous 20th century explorer Ernest Shackleton. The 154 souls on board were startled by a loud bang as the ship hit an iceberg shortly after it had departed from the Falkland Islands. The impact caused a 10 by 4 inch gash in the ship's hull, after which the vessel started to take on water. The ship's crew sent out a mayday call, which was picked up by the Argentinian Coast Guard and the Chilean Navy. As the ship began to list, the crew and passengers managed to escape to the lifeboats. MS Nord Norge was among the ships that responded to the distress signal issued by the MS Explorer. The rescued passengers were taken aboard the Nord Norge after they had drifted in the lifeboats for approximately five hours. Although they had endured freezing temperatures in the rescue operation, all of the crew and passengers survived without sustaining any injuries. The official report stated the main cause of the incident. He, the master of the vessel, was under the mistaken impression that he was encountering first-year ice when in fact, as the Chilean Navy report indicated, it was much harder land ice. Around 20 hours after the initial impact, Impact, the MS Explorer was lost under the waves. Number 6. The MTS Oceanos on the 3rd of August 1991, the Oceanos was on course to Durban from East London, South Africa. Before long, the ship started facing harsh weather conditions. The 40 knot winds and 30 feet swells brought about by the storm started to roll the ship from side to side. A muffled explosion was heard, and then the Oceanos lost its power. Captain Yanis Avranis was informed by one of his chief engineers that the generator room was in danger of being flooded. The generators were shut down as the crew feared they would short circuit the vessel was left adrift. The explosion had caused a 3.9 inch hole in the bulkhead and the water level soon began to rise. The water flowed through the drainage installation, rose through the ship, and started to spill out of showers and toilets. The captain and his crew did not raise the alarm and eyewitness reports claimed that they were ready to leave the ship by the time the lower levels had showed the first signs of being flooded. The passengers were left behind to fend for themselves. Luckily, the ship's SOS signals were picked up by nearby vessels. 16 helicopters were deployed by South African Air Forces to aid in the rescue operation. A harness was used to hoist 225 passengers by helicopter one by one from the deck of the sinking ship. The others had managed to get to the lifeboats. Amazingly, all of the 571 people on board were successfully rescued. The captain and crew were criticized for failing to meet their duties. The next day, the MTS Oceano sank completely, and its wreck lies at a depth between 92 and 95 meters. Number 5. The Costa Concordia over 4,000 crew and passengers were on board the Costa Concordia when it crashed on January 12, 2012, due to a critical error made by its captain, Francesco Schettino. The incident happened only hours after the Costa Concordia left the Italian port of Civitavecchia. The ship's initial course was a week-long cruise on the Mediterranean. As it made its way along the Italian coastline, Schettino ordered the steering of the ship closer to the island of Giglio as a salute to the locals. After the ship's black box was recovered, a recording was found in which Schettino had warned his helmsman, or else we go on the rocks, as he gave him the coordinates. At 9.45 p.m., the ship hit a reef outcrop at a speed of around 16 knots. The impact produced a 230-foot hole on the left side of the ship. As it took on more water, the ship started to tilt. It lost power and the engine room was flooded. The passengers were told that the ship had only suffered a blackout and that the situation was under control. Some of them had called the local police to report the problem. 
problem. When the Coast Guard contacted the ship at 22.12 p.m., Scatino told them, we have a blackout and we are checking the conditions on board. By this time, the ship had drifted towards the island's port. Soon afterwards, it began to tilt in the opposite direction. At 22.22, the captain ordered his crew to report a failure to the Coast Guard and request the assistance of tugboats. The order to abandon ship was given at 22.54 p.m. As the ship continued to tilt and sink, Captain Scatino abandoned the ship at 23.19. The second master, who had been left in his stead, soon left the bridge as well. Many crew members also left the ship. The vast majority of passengers managed to escape using lifeboats. However, the ship's angle complicated the rescue procedures. The Coast Guard dispatched boats and helicopters to help the stranded passengers. At 0042 hours, a Coast Guard commander had reportedly ordered Scatino to return aboard the ship and assist in the rescue procedures. He refused. In the end, the incident claimed the lives of 32 people. Francesco Scatino was arrested and trialed under charges of manslaughter and abandoning ship. Number 4. The RMS Empress of Ireland May 29, 1914, the Empress of Ireland cruise liner left Canada's Quebec Harbour on a course for Liverpool, England. Not long after the ship had left the port, the crew saw the masthead lights of Storstad, a Norwegian collier, several miles in the distance. The initial sighting took place in clear weather conditions from the ship's starboard side. However, a dense curtain of fog soon fell upon the two ships. Crews from both vessels made extensive use of their fog whistles. The desperate warning attempt did little to prevent the tragedy that followed. At 0200 local time, the two ships collided. The collier crashed bow first into the crew liner's starboard side. Although the Storstad remained afloat, the Empress of Ireland had taken heavy damage. It soon began to list on its starboard side. The impact was so sudden and violent that the crew did not have time to close the watertight doors. Water started to flood the lower decks. The crew and passengers that were housed in the lower levels quickly drowned. Some of the people in the upper decks began making their way to the lifeboats. Unfortunately, the angle at which the ship had listed made launching the lifeboats nearly impossible. Number 3. The MS Estonia in September 1994, in what was considered one of the worst maritime disasters of the 20th century, the MS Estonia, previously known as Viking Sally, sank in the Baltic Sea. The ship was traveling to Stockholm, Sweden from Tallinn, Estonia. There have been many speculations throughout the years as to what truly caused the shipwreck. Some experts have cited the turbulent conditions of the Baltic Sea as being a factor, with the ship having been hit repeatedly by heavy gales. This reportedly made steering difficult. Others blame the structural integrity of the ship, as it was designed for coastal waters and not the Baltic's open regions. The official report stated that the locks on the bow door had snapped under the pressure of the waves, separating the door from the rest of the ship. This meant that water could flood the ship. The crew was also criticized in the official report for not reducing the speed of the ship before investigating the sounds coming from the bow and for their delay in sounding the alarm. The MS Estonia started to heel onto its starboard side before ultimately sinking completely. Even though communications were down after the incident, intermittent distress messages made their way through the radio. The harsh weather conditions increased the difficulty of air and naval rescue operations. Out of the 989 people on board, only 138 were rescued alive. Some drowned, while others died due to hypothermia caused by the water cold temperature, 10 to 11 degrees Celsius. There were no reported survivors under the age of 12. Many died as they were unable to reach the surface and were trapped inside the sinking ship. It is believed that the MS Estonia was what some refer to as the watery grave for approximately 650 of the missing persons. A decision was made by the Swedish government to consider the shipwreck a memorial site. In the year that followed, several European nations ratified what would come to be known as the Estonia Agreement. Out of respect for the victims, the citizens and officials of these these nations were barred from the underwater exploration of the wreck. Number 2. The RMS Lusitania on February 18, 1915, during World War I, luxury liner RMS Lusitania sank after being hit by torpedoes launched by a German submarine. In response to the blockade imposed on Germany and the Central Powers by Great Britain and its allies, Germany announced that its naval forces would operate under a policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. At the time of its maiden voyage in 1907, the 32,000-ton heavy, 240-meter-long RMS Lusitania had been considered 
considered the largest, fastest, and most luxurious passenger liner in the world. As it set off from New York with a course for Liverpool in May 1915, passengers could read a warning issued by the Imperial German Embassy which said, vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or any of her allies are liable to destruction in those waters, and that travelers sailing in the war zone on ships of Great Britain or her allies do so at their own risk. Many believe that the ship's 21 knots per hour speed could outpace that of a German U-boat with ease. Others doubted that the Germans would take action against the civilian liner. Among the skeptics were also Winston Churchill and even W.T. Turner, captain of the Lusitania, who told a reporter, it's the best joke I've heard in many days, this talk of torpedoing. Nevertheless, tragedy struck on the 7th of May 1915, when a German U-20 submarine, captained by Walter Schwiger, fired a torpedo at the Lusitania. It impacted the ship on its starboard side. A second explosion soon followed. Many of the terrified crew and passengers thought it had been a second torpedo, but history has proven this had not been the case. Down in its hold, the ship was carrying more than 4,000 small firearms and around 4 million American manufactured bullets. The American government denied the allegations. After the torpedo strike, the cargo essentially became a bomb, ignited by the blast. The second explosion sealed the fate of the Lusitania. Schwiger noted his accounts of the events in the log of the U-20. Torpedo hit starboard side right behind the bridge. An unusually heavy detonation takes place with a strong explosive cloud. The explosion of the torpedo must have been followed by a second one, boiler, or coal, or powder. The ship stops immediately and heels over to starboard very quickly, immersing simultaneously at the bow. The name Lusitania becomes visible in golden letters. The Lusitania sank in approximately 18 minutes and 90 meters of water. By the time its bow reached the bottom of the sea, the stern was still above water. Out of the 1959 souls on board, 1,198 lost their lives. Following the incident, several nations turned their opinion against Germany. Historians have cited the sinking of the Lusitania as the main reason for the United States joining the war two years later, as 128 of the fallen victims were American citizens. Some even believe that the Lusitania was allowed to fall into the German trap intentionally, as a way of persuading the U.S. under President Woodrow Wilson to join the war. Number 1. The MV Wilhelm Gusloff Initially designed as a Nazi cruise ship for the Strength Through Joy organization in 1937, the MV Wilhelm Gusloff was ultimately used in 1945 to transport evacuees. As the Red Army was closing in on East Prussia, the German forces launched Operation Hannibal, coordinated by Admiral Karl Dunitz. Wilhelm Gusloff was among the ships used to evacuate German civilians, military personnel, advanced weapon technicians, and Nazi officials from several Baltic areas. After the evacuation was completed. The total number of people on board the ship was estimated at around 10,582, far exceeding the vessel's capacity. 5,000 of the passengers were reportedly children. Having previously been used for military purposes, the ship was equipped with anti-aircraft weaponry, as it was also transporting military personnel at the time. It did not receive protection as a rescue ship following wartime international accords. The MV Wilhelm Gusloff was met in the Baltic Sea by the S-13 Soviet submarine, captained by Alexander Marinesco. Three torpedoes were fired at the vessel's port side, and all three of them reached their target. The first torpedo pierced the ship's bow. The second hit the living quarters of the woman's naval auxiliary, killing 373 young women. Finally, the third torpedo hit the engine room, cutting off all power and communication. Less than 45 minutes after it had been struck, the MV Wilhelm Gusloff, once a luxurious cruise liner for Germany's elite, sank, bow first, into the Baltic Sea. Some of of the passengers died in the panic, crushed on the stairs and deck, or in the torpedo explosion. Many others drowned or froze to death in the icy Baltic. The vast majority of lifeboats had frozen in their davits, leaving people to fight each other for the few that were left. Several of the people on board jumped to their deaths as the boat was sinking. Children drowned in life vests that were too big. In one survivor's report, a German officer shot his wife and two children, but ran out of bullets before trying to turn the pistol on himself. As he begged for someone to give him a fire firearm, the officer fell into the sea. Many reports claim that the incident, which would be known as the greatest maritime disaster in history, claimed the lives of over 9,600 people. There are historians who debate whether the Soviet attack on the MV Wilhelm Gusloff was a legitimate wartime decision or a war crime against the civilians who had found a safe haven aboard the ship. 